Yes, welcome to Back Chat. A big thank you to all of our supporters, our partners, Whippersnapper Whiskey, Margaret River Roasting Co., Blue Bet, Shelter Brewing, Leadable Cameras, backchatpodcast.com.au is where to find all of the good stuff. We're very lucky to be joined in studio by the wonderful, highly experienced, very talented Nerly Meadows. Hello, Nerly. How are you? Yes. Thanks for having me. How uh, how how have you found your way to Perth, your hometown? <laughs> you, I feel like any time I see you on social media, you're anywhere but Perth. Well, I feel like I already have to correct you that Perth will never be my hometown. Oh, WA geez. is my home state. Collie is my hometown, even though I haven't been there in many, many, many years. But, you know, you a lot of WA listeners and you always have to stay true of to course. your roots. Classic, oh, classic Victorian over here just thinks <laughs> everything's <laughs> Perth. I'm a Victorian. Perth, Western Australia. It's the same shit. <laughs> it's all the same. Seriously. After the last couple of years, I will always say I'm a slightly less West Australian and a little bit more Victorian, which I never thought I would wow. say in my life. But after you guys kept us out and we were in lockdown for You guys, we didn't have anything to do with that. You're all in the same <laughs> pool. <laughs> all right. Thank you for our West Australian <laughs> listeners. We'll see you yeah. next week. Um, but no, I am back in WA. I just finished the T20 World Cup. So we were just talking off air that I've had about 13 flights in three and a half, four weeks. So I have no idea where I am, what time zone I am. When I wake up in a bed, I have no idea where it is. And that's not, it sounds fun. It's it's like, <laughs> sadly, no fun stories behind <laughs> the different beds. Well, well we're going to get into that. But I've, I've, I've yeah. you like usual, I forget where I need to start. We start with the same with every guest it's the first question we ask even though I asked how you were I should have asked we know you've done great things on TV radio you've probably been in newspapers you've been in the media for a, you know, a great period of time we're going to talk about the journey but I want to start with we want to know your greatest when we ask a sports star this we ask for their greatest sporting achievement not in their respective sport but I'm going to open the field for you your greatest mm-hmm. sporting achievement at any age. Now, you may be sitting there wondering, what's this trophy doing here? Well, we can happily oh, tell trophy? you. What's oh, that one. The trophy Gosh, I is. I that was even there. Dan Conts, under yeah. 12s. Uh, Chute Hill Cricket Club, uh, 5 for 16 in a grand final. There you go. I was a footy player for a number of years and earlier. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> kind of a big deal. But I was under nine state hurdling champion uh, in Victoria. The hurdles weren't very big, but I was the state champion under nines. What's your greatest sporting achievement? I loved sport, but I was short, slow, not particularly talented, That's all fine. of that. So my, my greatest sporting achievement is actually kind of funny because I, have a couple of months ago, hosted the Women's Basketball World Cup with Michelle Timms and a few others. And Timsy was like my childhood hero because she yep. was a household name when well, you guys are much younger than me. But when we were kids and this was before women's sport got the, you know, what it deserved. So I told Timsey and Kelsey Griffin and Jenna O'Hay and, and the others on our broadcast all about my basketball um, <laughs> abilities because I basically treated it like I had the same CV as what they did. <laughs> and now every time they they constantly ask me about my two broken collarbones and, you know, the time. So what sort of player yeah. were you? You sort of like a bit of a point guard? I was Della Vadova without the ability to shoot. That's me. And my shot same. actually was a little bit prettier than Delhi. <laughs> so I... I was the That's scrapper. I was the effort player. I was setting all the screens. I was the um, kid that yelled ball, 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 ball so much that one day one girl actually turned to me and said, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, unreal. I played like – I was the only girl on the soccer team with all the boys, um, scored one goal in four years. So I was that kind Scenes. of – Scenes. Yeah, amazing. I won the coaches award, the participation award, the most consistent award – you know, that that was it. But basically the height of my sporting ability was making the state team for Country Cup um, in basketball. And I broke my collarbone for the second time in six weeks. Oh, when I, love, yeah. I know, I know, right? Same collarbone? It, it, the same collarbone, yeah. So I broke it playing for Collie, repping Collie. Um, How? I dove on a lo- loose ball. Yeah, good. And the, <laughs> one Scrappy. of the girls from Bunbury came in on the other side and just basically crunched my left shoulder in between the court and her. Um, spiral Classic. break and um, I can't remember where it was maybe like Jesse Sinclair or somebody like that did their collarbone at the same time and we're out for like two weeks because you know you just go into surgery get it fixed my state basketball was six um, weeks later and it just a big girl from um, South Australia came up from behind and just clipped it broke um, straight 
straight away. And that was sort of the height of my basketball career. At so the, at the end of the basketball career. Yeah, ex- yeah pretty much. Like I've, played, I've played social ever since and hashtag social sport matters too. Yeah, but true. Dan, um, yeah. speak about that. Yeah, championships, C grade, Lofter, C grade, Warwick Leisure Centre. I think it mixed went netball. to Williton. Mixed netball. Got yeah, ejected from a game. Um, <laughs> it all matters. It does. Did you get chirpy on the court? I feel like just from our short... <laughs> like chatter that you would get a little chirp because I was the same. I didn't have any skills. I was short and slow, so I had to t- chat. I um, uh, <laughs> I I embrace my inner bogan basically. <laughs> yeah. like I go I go full collie <laughs> when I play basketball. Um, so yeah, there is a bit of and also I was my part time job for uh, I don't know 10, 15 years was refing basketball. That I, oh, I started doing it when I was rough. when I was about twelve or thirteen. As soon as you could, pretty much, I started doing it, and then all the way through uni. That so I did like A grade men's basketball through uni, um, and it's not bad pay for a uni job and you know exercise and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, so I felt like I had a right to be able to give it to the umpire because <laughs> I copped it. <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, I had a few there where like one of the guys. Um, out at Willerton threw a basketball at my head. And luckily I saw it coming and could – and that was pretty much the I only played, time I that played I – played at Willerton. Yeah, that was the only time that I pretty much – that was A-grade men's and that was the first time that I went and said, like, somebody needs to do something about this. <laughs> Holy these. shit. And then he never turned up for the tribunal hearing, so he was banned for life. Good. Well, I think so. I, I think even if I'm a dude, like, you don't throw yeah, – That's not men-women thing. That's like correct. player, you umpire that. thing. Correct. Like Human just, decency. Yeah. So that's probably the worst I had whilst um, umpiring. Well, there you go. There's an insight into Narrowly Meadows' sporting <laughs> life, right? Chirpy Deli. So, <laughs> yeah. like, so Dan mentioned it and you mentioned it, full Collie, born in Collie here in Western Australia, a uh, couple of brothers. Like, What's, what's, what's it like growing up? In, in Collie and sport and... Super lucky. Um, so we had a little five-acre hobby farm um, on the river that uh, mum and dad built the house. So it was sort of ours from go to woe. I was literally born in the house. Dad delivered me. Dad is a doctor, so it's not as extreme oh. as it sounds. <laughs> Still cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, both mum and dad were doctors. Mum went into mental health. Um, yeah, and so great upbringing, lots of sport, two big brothers, as you say, um, so... Yeah, had dad sort of made everything for us in the backyard. So we had like a third of a basketball court that he cemented himself. We had the cricket pitch, we had the netball ring, wow. um, swimming pool, all of those sorts of things. It sounds much more lavish than it was. It was all sort of handmade. Full collie. Yeah, full collie. <laughs> amazing. And, you know, dad would set up flying foxes in the backyard. Wow, you know, that sounds do, amazing. Yeah, we had the best upbringing, yeah. honestly. We'd go marining, we'd um, white water rafting, like all all of those sorts of things. We had a little um, uh, beach buggy that like my brother oh drove gosh. into the peppermint tree once and the helmet flew into the truck yard. Your, brothers, sort of your brothers are older than you, right? Yeah. So does that make you highly competitive, like trying to beat them? Y- yeah, and also higher physical pain threshold. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, yeah, and my my brothers are like that. two of the people that I'm most proud of in my life. My eldest brother Ross ended up playing hockey for Australia and debuted just before he was 30 so he wow. just never gave up and hockey is clearly not a sport that you make a lot of money like the greats of the game have kind of broken even yeah um and he was a goalkeeper so there's only you know there's only one up for grabs Shit. um so yeah his perseverance and um and persistence to to go for that is I'm really proud of and then my other brother's an actor and just the same thing perseverance yeah. and and resilience that you need to maintain a, a living in in those fields so yeah very close to my brothers and like we would invent games for example where we'd have like the third of the basketball court and, and they were only allowed to shoot from three um so it'd be them against me so once I got past them I had free reign <laughs> but I had to get past them first so little things like that we'd have all you know yeah and as you say like you'd get bicycle kicked in the chest playing soccer and you just get on with it yes I'm the youngest of three as well and I yeah. just I know you pain. Oh, I know your pain, but your passion. Yeah, exactly. I just want to beat them. Yeah, I remember one game we had. Um, we went to Colorado when I was twelve, and we we found this ice skating rink, and um, and it is the most bruised and bashed up I've ever been in my life. It was so much. What fun were you playing? Life. Ice hockey. Ice hockey. Yeah, oh just, just the, the three of us just mucking about <laughs> with like playing ice hockey. Um, oh my gosh, it was so much. Like, it was one of my um, yeah happiest childhood memories because. Just that real, yeah, courage, but you still felt safe even though you were getting hurt, and yeah. just that real joy that you have with siblings, kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. What um, what uni did you go to? 
I went to Curtin Uni and Good. um That's what, that was the answer I needed. You passed the test. <laughs> okay. Why? Because you also went to Wapa. Yeah, I did I did um, a year at Wapa, six months at Tennessee yeah. and right. two and a half at Curtin. I just have this like um, sort of chip on my shoulder about people that went to Wapa because they love to tell you they went to Wapa. This is such an inside journalist and, thing. Because uh, I went to Curtin as well. Yeah. But people forget about, you know, Curtin and just go straight to, oh, yeah, I went to Wapa. And so I just, I've always had that th- just nagging thing about me that. Yeah. Do you know what? The other thing is that because my brother went to as I call it, proper whopper proper. In, in the sense <laughs> yeah. that it was acting school. Yeah, yeah. So uh, not that our, ours was awesome, right? And, you know, Joe McManus, Pete Holland, shout out, like yep. definitely helped me in my career. Um, but a whopper to me, because Ian was always into acting, was always about the acting school. And so I, di- I felt like me saying whopper was kind of fake because it yeah, wasn't. Okay. Yeah, that's how I feel about whopper as well. Yeah. Opera is the West Australian Performing Arts. West yeah, Australian that's right. Academy of Performing Arts. Yeah. Something like that. It's now ECU. It's changed. The, yeah, the yeah. broadcasting one's changed. It's now just mm. a, a um, branch of ECU, I believe. So given your journey through uni and Curtin and Whopper and you're over in America and Tennessee, was working in sport as a presenter, journalist, broadcaster, was that your goal? Like, were, you, were you growing up like, this is what I want to do? When I broke that second collarbone. <laughs> the writing was and, on the wall. I had to look myself in the mirror and say, you've stopped growing. You're not getting any quicker. <laughs> you can keep trying as hard as you want, but you're really never going to be that good. Yeah. That's when I was like, okay, it's time to watch sport for a living instead. Yeah. So I was about 14 and um, sat down with mum and worked it out. Country public school, um, what's the best way forward to to become a sports broadcaster? And I never wanted to be a sports journo, but then there was never um, sports degrees. There was never broadcasting degrees. Mm. It was journalism. So I did a Bachelor of Arts majoring in journalism and I just basically targeted everything towards sports. And a lot of tutors told me that was stupid, but I was like, I don't want to be a journo. I didn't want to be a general news journo. I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. So my way of doing it was just to work my way up and just keep on going from there basically. And I was 17 just turned 17 when I moved to Perth to we, start that. We, we've got a lot of aspiring journalists working here with Backchat. We know a lot of people listen to it um, as well. You know, young, aspiring people that want to work in sport. Like as you reflect, like it's a, a, a little way removed. You're very experienced now in the media. It's 20 years. Not saying, it's I'm okay. not saying I'm old. I'm not saying I'm old. I am old. <laughs> I've been in it for 20 years. But like if you look back, is it, was there, you know, things that you could say if someone is just like – wants to get into the industry, do you think it's still relevant now? It's like, this is what I did and this is what I'd yeah, recommend. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel a little bad because the advice that I give to people is do as much work experience as possible, do as many internships, um, you know, approach people. Like one of the first things I did was I was at a, a function and Mark Gibson, um, you used to be at Channel 7 at the time, was uh, there and I basically just approached him and said, hey, I'm this kid doing this any chance I could, you know, get in touch with you. And he kind of appreciated the, I guess, ballsiness yeah, of yeah. it, mm. for want of a better term. Um, and, yeah, so I did a few of those sort of things. Second year uni, so I was just turned 18. Um, my cousin worked at Tennis West and he was looking for more media coverage of State Division Tennis. And so I – basically we got together and I said, I'll go out and I'll cover the tyres every Saturday and – Um, I would write an article and I called the Sunday Times and I said, if I write an article, I was an 18-year-old uni student, I said, if I write an article and you think it's any good, will you run it in the papers? And they said, yeah, if if we think it's all right, we'll we'll try and run it in the papers. In the mind, they're thinking, it's not going to be good, so who cares? Yeah, and also, like, was just lucky enough to be able to get in contact with the sports editor of the Sunday Times. Yeah. And because now there's websites and everything, I'm too old for, <laughs> I'm too old for that. <laughs> and then so um, I then went back to Tennis West and said, if I get an article published, will you pay me for it? And they said, yep, we'll give you a hundred bucks for every article you oh, get in. A hundred bucks? As an 18 yeah. year old 20 years ago <laughs> or 19 years ago. Um, and so I would go out and watch State Division Tennis um, tires all day, like all Saturday, with a real hefty laptop, like the first ever laptops. Probably, <laughs> I'm not that old, but you know, pretty close. And it was dial-up internet, so I would write the um, article, get quotes, do the interviews, get some quotes, um, and then I would try and find one of the Ethernet plugs uh, wherever I was. <laughs> dial up to the internet. Somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, dial up to the internet, 
email this in, you know, and I, I have almost like flashbacks into how stressful I wa- it was when it wasn't going through and sometimes I'd be calling and go, I, I swear I'm sending it, I'm sending it, I am, I, it's going to get there. Um, but long story short, I ended up getting an article in all 20-odd weeks of um, of that season. They got better coverage than they've ever got before. I got like essentially a $2,000 scholarship as a uni student. Again, right. And, um, and I was a published journo at the age of having just turned 18 in sport. So that's the kind of story that I tell to people that I'm like, just be proactive, reach out, do work. Even though I was willing to do that for free, I was just thought yeah. the Sunday Times got free content out of it yes. um, and local sport got more coverage. So I saw it as a win for everyone and doing work experience, cr- having those relationships because I didn't have any – like. I didn't go to a men, boy's private school. Mm. You know, my dad isn't connected to... Don't point at me. To anyone. What are you both pointing at me for? The, but there's no, there was no... Yeah, I was just a girl from the yeah. country, essentially. So you had to make your own relationships yes. along the way. And then when you prove you can do something and you show up often enough and continually do it, then people form a trust in you and you just sort of form relationships and just get opportunities from there, I guess. Did you... um Any big tennis names that you remember going oh i remember watching those in the state you know nick Kyrgios types nah sorry sorry i've got nothing for you there. that's fine <laughs> like you were grinding away really good <laughs> yeah. state division tennis players so it's yeah, yeah. there's an s williams i remember seeing a name float around yeah was, i mean there, there is an issue that we need to address um you know controversial maybe um told you we don't do controversy on this podcast but you're a Fremantle supporter yeah uh flag aka flag mantle big part of this podcast I did see it nearly in a flag mantle jumper at the start of the year. Yeah. Not sure how you got your hands on it, but <laughs> very, very nice to see you repping the back chat merch. Uh, G'day, uh, Mason Cox. Yes, hello, yeah. backchatpodcast.com.au <laughs> forward slash merch. Uh, the talk, how, do you, how do you start following Freo? Like, what, like, there's not many West Australians that go for them as far, as far as I know, but and before I coming th- out of the wood now. but Before I tell you this as well, I need to also make the point because I was saying that it's, I appreciate how hard it is for students right now is that COVID meant that they couldn't do work experience in a lot of areas in Australia. So they're coming from a long way behind. So shout out to everyone. And that's why I've tried to help people with emails and all that with advice and everything because I do feel for students who need practical hmm. help and they haven't been able to get it in the last couple of years. How did I follow Frio? Um, so I was born – well, no, I wasn't born into West Coast. West Coast – I'm really – why are you making me so old? Um, <laughs> hey, your words. So I – Got a telegram one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> seriously, the pigeons delivered my birth certificate. Um, the, um, I went to school in a penny farthing. No. Um, <laughs> You're not even old. Shut <laughs> yeah. up. Um, penny farthing. <laughs> So, um, yeah, basically my whole family went for West Coast. I went for West Coast when Frio first came about. And then I found myself in Western Derbies um, essentially feeling sorry for Frio because we lost so many to begin with and I was always a big cheerer for the underdog. And so I found myself wanting Frio to win in derbies and then I figured, oh, that must make me a Fremantle supporter then. And it kind of went from there. So I've never been a Freo supporter that hated West Coast. Um, I want West Australian teams to do well. Um, I then, like having spent a couple of years in Sydney when GWS came about and actually forged personal relationships with people, have a soft spot for them as well. So that sort of evolves and changes as you move along in life. But, yeah, became a Freo supporter. And the year that I was 100% like – this is me, I'm in it for the long haul, was the year we only won two games. And it was, I think it was around 17 that we beat, we finally beat Hawthorne. Um, And it felt like a damn premiership. So (laughs) (laughs) That's That's great. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure I'm, even though I joke about being old now, I'll be like the 80 something year old woman at the grand final week parade going, I never thought I'd see them. As as much (laughs) as I talk shit about Freo, we're very big Fremantle Mm, fans on this podcast. And like, it's been an interesting dynamic for me to separate myself from play for West Coast my whole career. Right. And so, I would say the majority of people think I'm a West Coast fan. And I, I am. I love the footy club, giving me every opportunity I ever had at AFL level. All my mates play there and still a lot still do. But I was never a West Coast fan. So, like, I, I grew up a Geelong fan. And so you grew up it, – it just that's the cool story about being a 
a fan. Like yeah. I don't feel like I've ever been a fan after I was drafted. And I've said that to Nat Fife before. I'm like, I've gone for Freo longer than you have, mate. Yes, <laughs> correct. Because like he grew up in Adelaide, right? Because you forget as no, a player. No, you, no. I, I know you know you Australia. appreciate and you understand the support, but you don't really fully mm. understand what it's like to be a fan unless you're lucky enough to end up playing at the club that you were a, a childhood fan right and we had the way you feel about things as a kid that's the purest it's ever going to be as far as our love for sport so yeah. yeah there are i'm very much in it for the long haul with with Freire and i'm pretty happy with that where they're out at the moment i would love the sponsorship to change to be more um you know planet friendly but that's another issue for a you know different <laughs> podcast um but yeah like i love what belly's done with it you know i consider belly a really great mate um and I love the changes that he's made. I love the changes that JL has made. JL is one of those people over the years that I haven't had a heap to do with, but he's reached out to me privately in tough moments in my career. And I just really respect that from people when they when they do things like that. And I'm lucky enough that I've got had a few coaches who do those sort of things um, or people in those positions. But, yeah, I think there's really good, solid people at the club at the moment. And, um, you know, and I think the AFLW has only strengthened that. And I think clubs that have had AFLW um, branches from the get-go are better off. Um, more inclusive spaces and appreciate things a little more because they've seen the women, how much they appreciate anything kind of thing. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm pretty proud of my club at the moment. We, um, I mean, we'll bounce around a little bit here, but like you talk about people and coaches reaching out and uh, how, do you, how do you see the sporting media landscape overall? Is it, you know, there's, there's news breaking, there's, um, you know, there's decisive issues, there's positive stories, there's, you know, hardship there's you know is it is it about the stories is it about the people is it about the sport is it about results like where do you sit in because people kind of fit in along the the scale right like where are you yeah i always saw myself as a storyteller um and a relationship based person so for me and particularly now in a freelance capacity the more i can put together life experiences with good people that the happier i am um, and I think most people, if you do that throughout your life and different people value different things, right? But life experience is good people. At the end of the day, I feel like you can get to the end of your life and go, yep, tick, that was pretty pretty well lived. Um, in the footy industry, I, I my personal feeling is that it's too negative. I understand that there are reasons for, you know, the way that journos are or whatever but my my feeling was always to get people to invest in the humans and if they invest in the humans they'll watch the games whether it's their team or not and then it all just comes back full circle um whereas i think if you only if you're only um getting people to invest in the controversy well that's not why we all fell in love with the game for the in the first place as kids like we were just talking about where it's the purest and when i was a kid all i wanted from you know, inter the interviews straight after the game were uh, was my favourite and all I wanted was a bit of insight into the game and whether or not I liked the person. That was essentially all I wanted and that's what I've then tried to do throughout my career, get a little bit of insight and get that personality and people can decide whether they're the goody or the baddie kind of thing. Mm. Um, yeah, so my personal feeling is that it's a bit too negative um, but, you know. I'm not the boss. How, correct. Neither am I. Um, but I do agree with you. Uh, footy. Like, how do you get into uh, footy media? You started, you're a tennis writer. So, <laughs> <laughs> so how do you get into being um, a broadcaster and a presenter in footy? Yeah, so I always loved footy. Um, obviously, country town. Um, we used to have the two teams. We had the Saints and the... Um, I've been to Collie. Yeah. Epic, epic footy, like, passion yeah, in that town. Yeah, Mines right? Rovers Eagles, which my brother played for. Um, and they merged in the end, which was enormous, and they became the Collie Eagles. Um, so yeah, that like the, nothing beats country ground. Everyone on their their Sunday rocking up or Saturday rocking up, driving in the car, tooting the horns for every goal. <laughs> Correct. You know, screen wipers going in the rain. <laughs> High beams. Yeah, all that <laughs> yeah. sort of stuff. You taste your first beer at the the club afterwards, and you know all those sort of moments. Um, so nothing beats that. And it's funny, actually, with my broken collarbone a few <coughs> months later, um, my brother broke his collarbone and he was the captain of the under-16s team and it was in the finals. And he then 
subsequently misses the grand final and they win the premiership. So he would have been – and, and under 16s, that's like peak. Yeah. Like some would argue that's actually even more than an Absolutely. AFL. Absolutely. I'd wow. agree with that. Seriously. So, but I was so annoyed because I missed out on state, even though it was country state, not real state. And <laughs> our phone <Sorry>. was like <laughs> – our phone was like – it was like an episode of Friday Night Lights before Friday Night Lights <laughs> existed. I was answering the phone constantly. How's he how, – how's Doctor and is, how's he going? Is he, is he or, or, we're just we're, – we're thinking of him all right. We're thinking – you know, those, those sort of awkward country like caring but not, not yeah, wanting yeah. to be too emotional. And I was like, no one gave a toss when I missed anything. Like I was so jealous of footy as a whole concept. That's why I get quite passionate about like women's footy and stuff because I, I missed that whole camaraderie that there's nothing like footy in mm. a country town in Australia, I think. And so, yeah, anyway, subsequently my brother um, misses the granny. His coach, Greg Little, gave him his premiership medallion. Oh, so the beverage, Bob Murphy. Beverage. Correct. Murphy so areas. Bob Murphy and Luke Beveridge now know that that's called doing a Greg Little. Yeah, good. <laughs> that's amazing. That's great. I've passed it on to them that, no, you, you didn't do a Luke Beveridge, you did a Greg Little. That's amazing. Yeah. Greg yeah. Little, what's yeah. up? Yeah. Shout out. Yeah, exactly. shout out to Greg. So does that lead you, like, that's your love of footy, but how do you, how do you, I, I'm not, I'm being facetious, but like, how do you get from riding in tennis yeah, 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 to, to, to footy? To well, working in footy? Because um, it's got to be hard, I assume. Like you said, girl from Collie. You know, I think it was just that it was like step three by positions. step thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I was, I did some stuff like work experience, like work experience, work experience. Like that is the number one thing to do because you get in front of enough people, and then if you're any good, you know, it's like it's like tryouts or training sessions or whatever it is. You just need enough people to see you do what you do, and eventually you hope that even though you don't have any connections, the the talent or the hard work shines through. Yes. So. I, ha- I did work experience at like 6PR. So I was with, you know, like Carl Langdon, Barra, these types of people. The Barra then obviously is at Channel 7. So they see how hard I would work there and then an opportunity would come up at Channel 7 um, to do work experience through Whopper. And I remember getting really angry at Joe McManus of, of, of Whopper at the time because I felt like this pressure that she thought I was just going to go in there and get a job. And I was like, it doesn't work like that. Most people have to go back to the country. Like this isn't – and then lo and behold, she was right. That's pretty much exactly what happened. I went in for work experience, um, did enough well. I did pick up new stuff as well. So I did – some death knocks I did some you know car crash incidents and you know various different things as a um, general news journo as well as a sports what, c- person can I ask what, what a death knock is or like people who hear that and brutal what, what is it it's brutal yeah um, and a lot of people don't understand it and I I understand them not understanding it yeah um, so a death knock is essentially I mean it can be going to somebody's house saying this bad thing has just happened to you um, what, are you willing speak? to talk about it mm-hmm. Um, or it could be at a crash scene or wherever it is, but it's essentially going up to somebody that's just had a, lo- a loss and saying, would you be willing to talk about it? Wow. That sounds brutal, right? But there are there's a reason why people do this. It can backfire monumentally and it did with me when I was younger. I had somebody, they shouted out, get off our property or else we're going to... Call the cops or, yeah. Well, a bit more. more. You person, yeah. Female violent kind of yeah. right. things. And... Um, and the camera just the cameraman just went just get in the car and all that yeah yeah um, and you kind of know that as part of it right that that could be the response people are mourning people are grieving yeah. they're in the most vulnerable the the reason why it can be a, um, a good thing to do is there are also plenty of people that have just lost a partner or just lost a child or whatever it is and they go I want this story to go public because I don't want anyone else to die in a car crash I don't want this to happen to anyone else I don't want somebody else to punch somebody else and not understand. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. there are so many people that in that moment, that's exactly what they want to do. They want to share their story and hope that some good comes of it. And you never know which person you're going to get. Yeah. So yes, death knocks sound like the most insensitive thing in the world. And it's certainly not how I wanted to be spending my time. Um, and especially as a budding sports journo, but I also understand why they exist. And a lot of good has come from those very moments of, you know, people going, oh, wow, that was raw and brutal and I'm now not going to look at my phone when I drive or, you know, whatever the circumstance is. Mm. Um, Anyway, how did I get into footy? Uh, (laughs) So did that at Channel 7 and then um, ended up sort of being the weekend. um, Tanya Armstrong was a weekend, one of the weekend 
uh, reporters at Channel 7 and then she, um, Fox Sports News actually started up in Perth. So they needed a replacement for Tanya and so she helped train me up and I did the weekends and just inevitably obviously doing a lot of footy. But I also did the Monday Waffle podcast, which um, oh. in at WAPA, so Adam Papalia and I, um, we created a podcast which we think is the longest running podcast in Australia without finishing. Um, so this was 2006. Wow. And we had all the equipment. We'd go out to the waffle. He really wanted to be a caller. I wanted to do the interviews and stuff like that. He tried to make me call and bless him. And we, we, I only caught up with him last night, so we're still great mates this day. Um, yeah, we sort of w- then put together a podcast and – uh, about the waffle, same sort of theory of there wasn't much coverage and we figured they'd appreciate it. And then I met Shane Woden, who had just been delisted through 6PR and I sort of pitched it to him and he was willing to come in as a guest and I thought, I just got a Brownlow medalist at our uni podcast yes. and no one even knows what podcasting is. I'm pretty <laughs> stoked with that. Um, so little things like that. We did it throughout the season and then the university actually, the course made it a part of the, um, the curriculum. So what Paps and I just did on our day off on our Mondays huh. and called it the Monday Waffle, which I think is still great. still a good name. Thank you. Holds up. Um, it's it's, they're still doing it. Anyway. Huh. So I did stuff like that with footy along the way. I always loved footy. It was like steps and steps. Step and by step. step by step by step. Got the job at Channel 7 in a part-time capacity. That turned into a job with two days a week in news and three days a week on Today Tonight. They wanted to do more sports stories. And that was one of the, still to this day, one of the most challenging things I've ever, ever done. Because I was 21 producing half hour sports specials on Perth's highest rating <laughs> program. But how uh, does sport uh, – I, my memories of today, tonight, is like bread's gone up again. Like that's the story is where does sport fit into those like, like, program? Yeah, like local tow truck driver yeah, yeah. like yeah. steals yeah. thousands of kitten dollars off Yeah, and he's bashing some cameraman, like knocking it off his shoulder, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I was – they <laughs> wanted to tap into the sports market because it was a Perth <laughs> local. So I did stories like um, doting dads, like <laughs> Brendan Cannon and um, <laughs> I was trying to think of who the others were at the time, but, you know, big, tough, burly guys with their cute little babies. Yeah. Um, that was one of them. But a lot of them were much more sporty than that. So it was Matt Gitto at the time was the highest paid um, yep. sport. Sports person, I think, at the time with the Western Force, certainly footballer in the country, um, and uh, like in Australia, I, I mean, like, like there was obviously like Australian. Lane Hewitt's yeah. paid more, but I'm talking domestically. But certainly footy wise, he was earning a lot more than everyone else, and he so a one on one with him of what that's actually like, kind of thing. Um, where and the, the half hour specials we did were that I produced were um, WA's most controversial sporting moments and the criteria were either it had to be a West Australian or happen in Western Australia. So um, that included a, you know, that was actually quite fun, got digging into the archives <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that. And then we had a panel deciding who it would be. The other one was... I'd watch that now. Oh, the well, other one we could was... probably submit some paces for it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let's continue. Um, <laughs> the other one was um, uh, the 1992... West Coast team if – sorry, 1994 West Coast team if they played the 2006 West Coast team, um, who would win? And we basically got – and it was, you know, 23 against 20, – uh, yeah. 21 v 20, 22. 21 v 22. Thank you. I was going the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. Now it's 23 with the sub. But um, – So there was some, you know, discrepancies in that way. But we basically went to Champion Data, I think it was, and they did the crunch the numbers and said, of all the things that matter, this is who would win. Can you remember who would win? Yeah, so 94 won. Oh, shit. But so I then also went into the archive and got the footage to match up of, like, one was a cloudy day, one was a sunny day. So things like that, we had to correct those sort of things. Banfield (laughs) was involved in both. Wusher was involved in both. Yes. So it was like one of my favourite things was happy Wusher, sad Wusher. <laughs> um, and then matching up all those sort of things. And the graphics department, who I felt so bad for them because they were literally just doing, you know, still graphics at the time. And I was like, so um, the boss has this like great idea of um, basically creating the last two to three minutes of a grand final. Um, do you think that's possible? So he literally frame by frame by frame. I had to find, you know, Chris Lewis oh my material gosh. up against, you know, like all this wow. crazy. And we need to find this story. Yeah, yeah we, we really do actually. Sounds amazing. And f- frame by frame trying to recreate with news 
this graphics technology and he did a wonderful job of it and I remember him being so angry but also so like appreciative of how much I was also trying to help <laughs> with everything and even sorry this is turning into the longest winded story this but, is a podcast we do what we like yeah. um but I had to find people to talk about it obviously um and so um I, I I like got a few from each, but my favourite one was Dean Kemp because Dean didn't do a lot of media, still doesn't, to no. be quite frank. And I knew he owned a Mitre 10 and so I looked it up in the yellow pages and I called them Mitre 10 and just, you know, start somewhere kind of thing. And I'll never forget it. He answers no. the phone and goes... Dean Kemp's might attend Dean Kemp speaking. <laughs> Dean <laughs> that is like, amazing. No. And so I'm like, Dean I'm, oh, 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 hi, Dean. Um, my name's Narrowly Meadows. Um, I'm a uh, reporter producer at Today Tonight. Like, that's never the sentence you want to hear, is no, it? When you're calling someone, a small uh, business. Yeah, or like he's expecting on a couple of planks of four by two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, anyway, I explained to her, and he goes, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be a part of that. And so I got to walk back into Mario Drazio, one of the toughest bosses, but once again, still to this day, one of my confidants in media and loving a bits. He made me cry the first time I ever had a meeting with him because he was so relentless, but he has backed me in. He, he pushed me so hard and believed in me and I overachieved what he did. And I will never forget those learning experiences and having somebody believe in you, push you, but then also be appreciative Good of the job. whole thing. Yeah. Um, he then, uh, like, he had me for life, basically, from mm. that. And he, even when we catch up now, he's like, still some of the highest rating things we ever did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I got Dean Kemp talking about it all and he was fantastic and, yeah, it was a very – but half an hour of television is a, is a, a lot. lot for somebody yeah. who's literally never, you know, walked straight out of uni into that, – I mean, that, that's, that story is so relevant. So we had the 92, 94, 06, 18 Premiership reunion and – it was your story recreated in real life. There was – Wusha was fighting with me about the back lines of each side and Jacko was chiming in about stuff and then Summer's carrying on about <laughs> the foot, JKV yeah, Summage. And so I want to find the story and oh, send it, it through. Would, I mean, it would be embarrassing oh, given how far technology has come. But the actual story in itself, itself I think still holds up and we got um, – Carl and Barry to do the commentary for the fake grand final and yeah and like it's rated epic. its absolute ass off and it, it was really good fun and just one of those really good learning experiences as a journal as well of picking up the phone or whatever it is but yeah it was fun you um you work with Fox Footy for sorry before we do yeah, that great. who would win 2018 v 94 then if 94 beats 90 if 94 beats 2006 does 18 stand a chance Absolutely, it does. I know you're looking at it narrowly. Because <laughs> <laughs> I still, th I think 2006. I'm surprised 94 would beat 06. But what do you think? I mean, no, you're the I'm expert really, here. I'm thinking. Um, I mean, I'm the only one old enough at the table to have watched all of them. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a Geelong fan. 92, 94. I don't know how young you think we are. Yeah, what the heck? Not, we're not no <laughs> spring chicken over here. Seriously. <laughs> um, I mean, 2018 was pretty. Mm. I know I don't, you know. Just, mm. just be honest. But I know he's, he's in. The, I mean, the funniest thing is not. I think ninety two was probably the the one. That yeah, that that the boys involved with it say that too. Yeah, the I think ninety two was the one. It's. I don't know why they chose ninety four over. I'm not. I'm not actually sure. I can't remember that. But I think ninety two was was probably the one. Right. But yeah. But then I. So I was working with Maney at the time, and then all of that happened as well. So right. it was a really. It was a life, like a big life experience that four years at Channel 7. Yeah. A I lot mean, of learnings. Well, that was what I was sort of leading into with the Fox footy stuff. So you worked with them for close to a decade and um, you're in footy for a long time. You're in cricket now, you know, across other things. But like what, what are the – how do you reflect on that time? Like turning points, big moments. You must have – like that's a big moment, Maney passing away. Maney was a – like – Mania was a huge moment because <laughs> so I'm telling so many uni stories, but it's always more fun to reflect on the old Absolutely. stuff, isn't it? But Mania is another one who um, will have my love for life because I was a uni student and one of the assignments that we were given was call somebody you admire in the media and, um, and do a 
you know, whatever, do a story, um, an article on them. And so I think I was second, either first or second year uni. And once again, I thought, you know, most people were going for sort of lower, lower less profile. And I went, well, stuff. Low hanging like, fruit. <laughs> I just thought, I'll go. Oh, why not? I'll try and get Manny. And so once again, I called it. A landline's easier. Called right? my, called my out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> Eighteen. Called Chris's. Channel Seven and said, um, "Hi, is Chris Main wearing there?" I, not thinking that you could actually do that. <laughs> and then they put you through to Maney. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and, <laughs> and I sort of said, "Hey, I'm a I'm a uni student. Um, you know, big fan of like the energy that you bring and what you what you do on air." And um, I have to interview somebody that I admire. I was wondering if you would give me some of your time at, at a time convenient for you. Yeah, no worries, mate. No worries at all. Um, you know, how about X, Y, and Z? <coughs> and I said, great, amazing, thank you. When that time came up to record it, a mate of mine got in a car crash and I had to go and – and it was fine, but I had to go and help him out. But I, it was the exact same time. So I called Maney and I said – I'm so sorry. I know I'm supposed to be doing this interview right now, but my mate has just been in a car crash. Oh, mate, no, no, no. No worries, no worries. You just go do what you need to do. Like friends and family always come first. You just call me whenever it suits you kind of thing. And I'll never forget that. I was terrified. I was like, oh, you know, it's what not to do as a uni student, waste somebody's time. And, um, yeah, and then eventually I, I called him, did the piece, and then lo and behold, a year or two later, he's a colleague of mine, Hmm. Um, and still to this day, the, one of the last text messages he sent me was about, um, getting to my brother's hockey grand final, like letting me go from work early that day. So I could go and watch my brother in, um, win a premiership, Hale's first premiership in a hundred and whatever years. And Maney was still about, no, no, that's more important, you know, and he just was always that guy. So yeah, he, he was, you know flaws as as we all do but for me he was so supportive of me he was um he was such a a good friend and he you know he was an oversharer he wore his heart on his sleeve and yeah it's i like i'll always love maney and um yeah he was such a he was such a supportive person for me as a young kid coming through but also as a woman coming through um but and he and baron you know baz and, and chris young and but Maney was just had that warmth to him that he would just do anything for you. And, um, yeah, so that was a real defining moment in the sense of rocking up that day, hearing hearing the news that morning from the chief of staff um, of what had happened, then having to work through the day. Um, and it's also one of the most proudest moments I'll have because um, – the way because I'd only been there for a couple of years right but Sue for example had worked with him his entire media career Mm. there are plenty of others like that who loved him and I will never forget how the entire newsroom rallied around much like when you have a tragedy in a footy club it is a team and the way that everyone got the news together that day knowing that everyone watching would also be mourning in their own way because they all loved him it's one of the proudest days um, but one of the hardest days and yeah, I'll, like, I'll always be grateful that I had that time with Maney and, and who he was as a person. Sort of just listening to you, like, we haven't done much of this stuff <laughs> on camera or on air, but like, we've crossed paths along the journey with your time at Fox footy and seen you, you some of your great work, um, not only TV, but, um, ordinary speaking is podcast award winning and it's probably a good time to kind of transition into a chat about that because like hearing you speak now you said your mum was in, in mental health yeah. as, a, as a doctor you've spoken about different experiences around missing grand finals you know <laughs> whether it be the not real state team like you refer to it <clears throat> your brother missing it but like and many all these different stories around the, the mental side so ordinarily speaking from the, the episodes i've listened to are around um big moments like and 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 sometimes painful moments um it doesn't seem like it's something that you were like oh i'm gonna do this because it's gonna be good for me or my career like it seems like you're kind of built for it would that be correct yeah my three um great passions are sport storytelling and and mental health really um like i always had an interest in it because of mum's mum being a psychologist and i always had a much greater understanding than the average kid of 
you know, the power of reframing and resilience and, and positive thinking and all those sort of things. So all the things that are buzzwords now I sort of was brought up with mm. and still remember being like eight years old and saying to mum, mum, I don't need you to fix that. I just need to vent. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sit down on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> like, Tell me how you're feeling. People who don't have self-insight, I'm like, I've been self-analysing since I was five years old. I know my issues. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's hilarious. About that's yours. That's <laughs> um, so, yeah, and... And I, I was once told actually um, that I, I cope too well with those sort of things because I think I was given so many tools that there's some stuff that I should have spoken out about earlier or I should have, you know, done more about it and I didn't I just because I cope too well with mm. that sort of stuff. Um, but I think throughout my career I've always wanted to tell those stories. Like, for example, before it was popular to do so, Daniel Kerr talking about um, – you know, he's drinking and um, how Wusha helped him through it. And I remember doing an interview um, about that and taking it to the news boss and he was just flabbergasted by how open he was. And I'm like, these are the kind of things that I can do. People people want to share stuff with me because I think they can tell that I – the whole point behind the podcast, for example, is that I wanted to – um, help people listening and make athletes relatable. Because like I said, I feel like it's all too negative and yeah. it, it, athletes are just human at the end of the day. And I, I never want it to be something they regret. I only ever want it to be cathartic for them. And generally speaking, most athletes tell those sort of stories because they do want to use their story to help people. And that's the most rewarding thing in the world when you get a message from a stranger saying, um, you know, you helped me quit drinking or you, you – Greg Heyer got one after doing the episode with me where – and he shared it on his social media that somebody said, I was driving home to end my life and oh. I was listening to your podcast and oh. I didn't do it. And that, like, I still get goosebumps every time I say like that. There's nothing more powerful than that. So for me, if you can use your platform to help people and make people relatable and, you know, connect and all of those sort of sort of things, then, then that's some of the most rewarding thing things that I feel. And if somebody was ever, like, sort of talking about my career or whatever, like, I would like to think the legacy in that space is one of my sort of strongest aspects of what I've been able to do. That doesn't mean – like, I love having a laugh. I love the piss-taking interviews. And, I, you know, I can do the comedy and all that sort of stuff as well. But I think those really meaningful ones where you feel like you've maybe helped someone along the way and just use sport as a platform to do that, mm. they're the coolest ones. And then – as it's turned out in my career for whatever reason I'm a sports broadcaster that's had to report on a lot of death a lot of death and um and it's been hard like I've had you know whether it's Spud or it's Phil Hughes or Phil Walsh or Maney um Dean Jones you know, Roy, Warney, like these are all people I knew, some I considered friends, some I, I had close friends who loved them dearly. And it's a lot to go live on air and there's a couple of aspects to it because even, you know, Drew Morfitt, who I worked with for five years on ABC Radio and had a friendship with, like not only – like with him, I was on air – doing a two hour show when I heard it in my earpiece and it was people in Sydney giving me the news. So they had no idea the significance of it to Mm. me. And I'm on air getting something through my ear that a mate's essentially a mate has died. And then I have to deliver that news to people knowing that, like I said about Maney, those people listening also care. They feel like they know us, right? That's the whole point. We invite like they invite us into their homes yes. or their houses or their their cars or whatever it is. So we're part of it. And so even though they may never have met you, they feel like they know you. Mm. Um, and so when you're a presenter or a news journal and you know you're the one telling them this person is no longer, like that's a heavy burden to bear and you need to do it with a, with a, a level of compassion that, you know, doesn't make it about you but also shows that you are human and unfortunately, I've had to do that a lot for a sports broadcaster. And I'll never, like, I'll never forget Husey. And I, I think one of Australia's greatest ever sporting achievements and one of the most um, undervalued achievement is winning the 2015 Cricket World Cup because those boys lost their best mate. They played against India the whole summer and the Cricket World Cup came at the end of it. It was one of the most brutal 
summers you could possibly imagine in any working environment losing a mate like that and have at your workplace yes and then showing up to do the same job day after day after day after day for months and then have the you know the full-on nature of a world cup campaign and the pressure of it being on home soil to win that world cup is astonishing and australia does not I don't think, appreciate it in its entirety the way that it is. Maybe it's the decline of the one-day game. I don't know. But what those boys achieved, and because I saw it every step of the way, I was there. I was was standing outside the the hospital hoping that he came through, knowing that he wouldn't. I was there watching my mates go in and out. I was at the funeral. I was at every test match. I was at every press conference hearing Virat Kohli talk about how much he also loved Hughesy. Uh, you know, the whole set and then doing the World Cup. And so when they win the World Cup and Maxi Glenn Maxwell runs up to me and gives me the biggest hug of all time, like you, you, you live it with them. I'm not – don't get me wrong, I'm not them. I'm not saying that. But I just think as a country we don't fully comprehend that sporting achievement. Oh, yeah. Well, mm. I certainly don't and I haven't heard it from that perspective before yeah. and that's why sometimes things lack context and perspective. So – it was always, like you'd see the individual performances after that happened and, you know, whether it was scoring 100 or, um, you know, and they would look up to the sky and you yeah. could see it, like the the effect that it had on them individually. Like but, the yeah, the, the, as a holistically, as a team p- pulling together, it is. It's a and massive And every net session, every time somebody got hit or every, yeah. you know, no, every, every bounce, ball. like it yeah, was every ball, it's like... Living yeah. that and then, you know, you say what's on camera, but you don't, you know, as athletes often talk about the four walls of the hotel room, you know, how lonely that space is. And, you know, they all of these boys will never be, I won't be the same after living through that. And I, I didn't even know him that, that well. You can't live through an experience like that and ever be the same, mm. um, particularly when it happens in your place of work. And, um, and also just the sheer human that Hughesy was he was a legend he yeah. was just so fun and affable and um and and that was the other thing that everyone thought he was their best mate like doing the interviews afterwards he was one of those people that everyone oh he was my best mate oh he was mm. my you know and we all know people like that don't yep. we and mm. it's not that they're all lying it's that that's how he made yeah. everyone feel mm. russell wolf comes to mind yeah exactly yeah uh, yeah um, another, another great person yeah exactly yeah. right um i want to change gears a little bit um What's it like working in in the IPL in India? With it, it seems like just seeing a little glimpse in the T Twenty World Cup over here. With was it India Pakistan that yeah. played? Mm-hmm. Just the sheer fandom that cricket is in India. Like nothing, you know, AFL hundred thousand people like wouldn't even scratch the it's surface on like a yeah, Tuesday game in India yeah. by the looks of it. Like what? What's it like being over there? What? Yeah, well, like the India-Pakistan game, for example, digitally 18 million people were watching live, let alone the TV yes. rights at the time. So, I mean, the numbers are just ast- yeah. astonishing. Um, and the passion, like you say. And and one thing that I've come to realise is, um, like they've had, you know, Sachin Tendulkar, MS Dhoni, they've had absolute legends of the game. Mm. But... They're so damn good at cricket now because they've the the depth of the country and the passion has now caught up to be like having played the game for such a long period of time that it's all and the infrastructure and all of those sort of things that we always had an advantage on. They've now caught up and yes. you have the depth of, of the talent in a that country. A billion people. <laughs> Correct. It's now I, I like it's kind of unstoppable at what, this point. What, what what's it like working there though? Has it been su- surpro- like w- like have have you worked there much in the past? You're working with uh, Star Sport, is that? Yeah, you, Star Sports. Star India, Sports. Yeah. Like, has it been? Like, what's you? Like, how you? Like, how have you found the I've experience? Loved it. It's it's amazing. They're such amazing people. Um, and so I've done three years with them now. Three IPLs, but kind of four IPLs because one was split. Two World Cups. Um, they're really caring people. I had. So a lot of it I've done in the UAE because of the pandemic. I've only worked with them since the pandemic happened. But when the height of the pandemic anywhere in the world was when it was in India mm. um, and Australia, Scott Morrison in all his wisdom banned us all together. Absolutely. Um, and Australia. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Get out of politics. Yeah. Um, so I was – I made the call to go over to India for that. The numbers at the time when I agreed to it were about 14,000 cases a day 
Um, and as I was in uh, quarantine to go into the bubble each day, it was like, you know, 50,000, 100,000. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. But I always, I knew that that was what I was signing up for. I'd done a bubble with them in the UAE. Um, the whole, you know, I trusted the bubble. I trusted the experience. I trusted the people. And, um, yeah, so that experience, though, for how it ended up being, which was I couldn't be, um, like, anywhere with any of them without – the moment we were off air, one of them was on the phone to find oxygen, find a hospital bed. Every single one of them was looking for someone they cared about to get help. And it was eye opening. And yet every single day, as things are escalating back home in the sense of, um, we're not, you can't get home, all of these sorts of things. Um, every single one of those Indian colleagues were checking in on me every morning going, are you okay? Is your family okay? And I'm like, Here's the difference. Uh, yeah, I'm in India, but my family's safe. And most of my family are in Western Australia mm. um, where COVID never happened. Fortress. Uh, <laughs> and they were still checking in on me every day. Like I couldn't I couldn't believe the kindness and, and genuine too. Yeah. And I'll never forget that. So that's the kind of people they are, that they were dealing with so much of their own stuff, but they were still looking after me. Um, and that was such an incredible, interesting life experience and you talk about perspective and all that sort of thing. Like this is a country where you, social distancing is a privilege, you know. Um, not everyone can physically socially distance in Which India. Crazy. Yeah. And just to see what they went through and then to see them emerge from it and then the emotional experience of this year at the IPL final, we were still in a bubble but the fans were back and so 100,000 at the stadium for the final. Like I just got really emotional on behalf of them and everything that they'd been through and cricket is everything to them and to not be able to watch that you know, live and, and it's just such a different perspective there. Like in Australia, people sort of say like, you know, you, you're so privileged as a sports person. Like how come you get to go and work in, work in the bubble? Whereas we all have to stay at home. And I get that perspective. I totally do. Yeah. Whereas in India, I was getting messages from it. Cause I was worried about that. I was worried about how it looks dressing up, going and reporting on a cricket match every day when people were suffering. But the feedback I was getting from people was, um, thank you for doing this. Thank you for putting a smile on our face. Thanks for giving us some sort of relief. And it, just just such kind people. Hmm. Yeah, it's cool. Huh? Um, Dad used to work in India a lot and he's ref- – he, that we're talking about things that happened a while ago. Like he used to work there in the 90s, right? And he – some of his best mates are from India and exactly the same reflections of just yeah. the kindness and – um, and genuine too. Yeah. So they're not just doing it like if. and and the passion as well. Like yeah. you can just see it when when you watch. You got you got any more questions for uh, um, that was, MCJ one by the oh. way was one of the yeah. Greatest. Well, that, that's what I was going to yeah. ask. Like, so you've seen the, what cricket's like as a, a fandom in India. What's your current take on fandom of cricket in Australia? Because to me, it seems like it's sort of dwindling or there's less of interest. But that's from the outside. You're sort of living it. Yeah, it, it makes me sad if I'm being honest. I I would really like people to galvanise right now. I feel like the it's split down generations and I I feel like my age is kind of that middle point. Um, I think it's like... We're like, in the same generation. I Stop talking that, about yourself like you No, but this like is our generation. Specifically the age that I'm at, I'm between the two yes. generations. Like Pup was at the start, like he was Pup and he was when I started. So he was that first younger guy from the general you know and and in age group i just feel like like smartphones came in phones came into high school smartphones came in that's where i feel like the real this split is, is this is a, well this is mate this is us yes. you know where the no no, no but the, i'm not discluding you from no, this sorry no. include us <laughs> this isn't about you actually <laughs> yes it is about you this is a podcast about you <laughs> um so it's i feel like there's just such a generational like not gap but just D- divide right divide yeah. mm. divides the right word and it makes me sad because i i think the core values are still the same um but it's okay and i would argue it's really good to care about the environment and care about those sort of things and it's really good to want to be more inclusive and more communicative and to not be my way or the highway and you may have different beliefs but we can still do this together mm. And I think Australia has changed a lot and I think 
cricket has changed a lot and I think the sporting landscape has changed a lot and I think we need that's a that's a good thing for me there was no women involved in cricket you know 20 years ago in the broadcast yeah. so for me it's certainly a good thing I just wish there was a bit more of a coming together now and actually supporting these guys because here's the thing no I, don't get me wrong I get sandpaper get I get that people were hurt by what happened but I also we talk about perspective none of these guys have done anything really like as far as if we're looking at the scale of mm. what bad people can do and what some bad sports people have done over the years mm. these guys ain't it yeah they're all good genuinely like across the board pretty good people like, even if you get irritated by whatever mm. they haven't done anything and so i th- think sometimes the no one likes this Australian cricket team like they're all a bunch of whatever like can we all just take a step back and actually assess what it is that we're actually angry about right now because there are some people and some sports people that have done some really bad criminal nasty things Mm -hmm. maybe get more angry about those people and get more outraged and fired up on those conversations and less about I don't know, whatever supposedly Pat Cummins has done wrong. Mm. I don't understand why we don't like him suddenly you, as a group. You do have a, you do mention a good point though. Like you do have a good balance because, you know, you say that um, – I've forgotten his name, but you uh, editor at the West or uh, – road you really – Mario? Uh, Mario? No. Uh, Mario Durazzo. Yeah, Mario. Sorry, so today's like, night. Yeah, today's yeah. night. Yeah. So like – you have the balance of of being ridden hard, hard by by a coach because there's some Justin Lang and stuff there, but like the, if we're talking about the generation stuff, it's like the old school like win win or country like, kid as win, well. Yeah, win yeah. or lose, that's it. It's yeah. like you either win, win or, or you're a loser. Yeah. Um, but then you have the 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 new age thing, which I kind of feel I find myself in it a little bit with the the player v journo stuff. Like I've tried to make a good crack of of separating myself from a player and doing the, the media stuff and. I fall in the same basket as you. It it lands somewhere in the middle with pretty much any issue that ever exists, by the way. If we move out of cricket, like anything that ever happens, there's the people that were in its truths, there's people that, you know, have opinions on it, like maximum this or maximum that. But the actual landscape, it always lies somewhere in the middle. Like there's always two sides, there's only ten sides to every story. It's not like this is a bad person or this is a bad team or this is a good person or this is a good team. It's usually, no matter what the issue is, this is footy, this is – it's like it's somewhere in the middle. Right? Yeah, and we would watch episodes of The Bill when I was a kid and I would want to think that there was a baddie and a goodie and then mum would say, yeah, but you don't know what he went through as a child. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I feel like I've always had a bit of a – there will be a reason for X, Y and Z. Yeah. But then there's also times where you go, okay, no, now's the time to be accountable and why are we not holding this person accountable for mm. their behaviours and why are we not caring more about their victims rather than whether or not they're going to be okay. And I think our – um, we're still not there in Australia for that um, and that is where more my passion lies and I would also like to think, yes, I'm in, I'm in that generation gap and even with my brothers, they're a little bit different with the way that they think in those sort of things and the, and the toughness and the respect. I would say angry doesn't mean tough and that is a big thing. Like you, you can yell at people or whatever and that doesn't make you tough. And I don't respond when people yell at me because my dad wasn't a yeller. And so when somebody yells at me, I shut down. Whereas if you give me feedback, I will do my damn best to to rectify what you're saying mm. as much as I can. And if I can't, well, then it's just wasn't possible or whatever. And <laughs> our friendly lawnmower is right. back here on the podcast. I was going to say, you're, you've got a flight to catch, I believe, now, at least. You've just ducked in here on the way to uh, the airport. I've got a couple of social media questions to ask you. Have yep. you heard of social media? You don't even have to answer that question. I know you have. It's not social media. <laughs> it's social media. Yes, that's right. If we're talking about waffle on, uh, is that what it was? Waffle on? No. Monday waffle, mate. The Monday, Monday waffle. Sorry. I don't <laughs> They're about as worldwide as each other. The Monday <laughs> Waffle and Social Media, globally renowned segments of podcasts. This has been running for a long time. I will say Social Media has been running not quite 2006, but a long time. This is where the people get to ask you the questions. You've heard enough from Dan and I. Mm-hmm. This is where we put it out to the people and they ask the questions. You ready? I'm, I'm staggered that somebody's actually interested. So let's Born ready. That's right. Cam Long 05. As a fellow West Aussie, why are the West Coast Eagles a better team than Frio? <laughs> he's, he's baiting you there because I believe he knows you're a Frio fan. <laughs> Cap. 
<laughs> well, I would say um, because they have four more premierships at this point in time, which yeah. Very <laughs> that's good. just that's the way that it is. Black and white. Um, which is why I go for free because we're the underdogs and it's going to mean more. <laughs> Henry.bear1. What has uh, been your favourite game to be at? Ooh. This one is really hard. And even just this year alone, I feel like I've had half a dozen best days of my life. Like, <laughs> so I'm, I'm super lucky. Like from Rafael Nadal, Ash Barty at the Australian Open to Super Bowl to the IPL final to being in Pakistan for Australia's first test match in, you know, more than two decades to MCG um, of uh, like Pakistan, India, getting to interview Virat Kohli for 10 minutes afterwards and, um, you know, like unheard of to Lauren Jackson, 30, dropping 30 points in the bronze medal match. I, I was at all of those events live. So I, even this year alone, it's really hard to pick something, but I probably will always go back to that 2015 one day world cup final for the yes. reasons that I had spoke yep. about earlier. And on top of that, the 2020 women's uh, world cup final from a female perspective and the way that the world then shut itself days later, like that mm. to me was also a very emotional moment for a girl that couldn't play cricket or, you know, whatever. I like it. That's very good. Um, party underscore, party underscore boy underscore. <laughs> <laughs> um, good question though. How did you compose yourself during such an emotional interview with Brett Delidio? Yeah, um, that one was really hard. That was still one of the most emotional ones I've ever done um, because I gave a shit about lids and that's the other thing I invest heavily in people and I lose a lot of sleep over whether or not they're going to regret it or whether or not they're going to um yeah it's it's just hard because people are giving you their most intimate Mm. moments um for the public to consume and lids was a really interesting one because he told me a year and a half before that interview I want to do an interview with you at some point I'll let you know when I'm ready I said sweet do you just let me know? You got my number. You just let me know. And it was literally 18 months later. He said, I'm ready now. I said, mm. cool. Like I didn't even check it. I, and no one knew all of – like mm. people knew a couple of things. No one knew the blow after blow yeah. after blow after blow. And, you know, and Brett – like Leeds has always had this sort of pretty boy kind of um, persona as well all the way through. And, um, and to hear the emotional depth from him I think surprised a lot of people. I had seen that from him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's not about composing yourself. It's just about remembering it's about the person telling their story and not about you. So whilst it's okay to get emotional, you need to, you need to control yourself um, because it's about being there and supporting them. Um, but I was really pleased for Lids that he was able to share his story and that people were able to get a greater insight into the depth of him as a man. If you don't know what we're talking about, you're listening along, uh, just Google Narrowly Meadows, Brett Yeah. Uh, I watched it prepping for this interview and I wasn't, it didn't leave me very well. I, it was, <laughs> it was, yeah, incredible, incredible. It was an incredible interview. So was, hats uh, off to you, but it was more hats off to Brett Delidio. I'm Sharon, pretty sure so it was right. the last in-depth interview I did for Fox. Mm. Yeah. Well, no, incredible. So if you don't know what we're talking about, have a look check at it that. Check it out. Um, last one, we're going to get you to the airport, Tappy95. Finish with a laugh. Uh, okay, it's this is from also Lego Man eighty seven underscore with underscore. Um, how does Narrowly like her eggs? Sincerely, the Egg Man. <laughs> now we get this person asking how our guests like their eggs every time. So it's he'd a love Mayan Cargaval. Mayan Cargaval loves eggs. I remember asking him in an interview on the Boundary about how many <laughs> eggs he consumes a day because I found it fascinating. How many? Um, it was a lot. I can't remember now. It was this is twenty eighteen, but it was it was a lot. Like of eggs. carton areas. Oh, it's through the week, yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, okay. Uh, I, I tend to have mine poached, mm. um, smashed avo with a bit of chilli and poached eggs on whole okay. grain or multigrain. Um, otherwise, if I'm feeling naughty, I'll have scrambled with chilli through it. It's a bit exotic, isn't it? Yeah. Scrambled eggs. Pretty good. Mm. Very good. Narrowly, that's it. Have you had fun? It's been excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. <laughs> My God, oh, Father. Look, sometimes in this podcasting world, you're not prepared for things, but finishing an interview like that is about as good as it fucking gets right now. <laughs> Nearly Meadows, uh, you know what to do. Backchatpodcast.com.au, uh, backchat double underscore across socials. Thanks to our partners, Whippersnapper Whiskey, Margaret River Roasting, Blue Bet, Shelter, and Leadable Cameras. Sign up for Patreon. Might, Ooh, good stuff there. Yeah, might get some good stuff. See you next week.